The Precambrian is the name given to a super eon that encapsulates the first 4 billion years or so of Earth's early history. It includes the Hadean, Archean, and Proterozoic eons and ends about 541 million years ago at the beginning of the Cambrian. It was during the Precambrian that we see the first appearance of life on Earth and its evolution from single-celled prokaryotic species into complex multicellular eukaryotic organisms. In this video, we'll explore what fossil evidence we have from the Precambrian and what life in the Precambrian must have looked like, so stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. In this video, we're going to explore what life was probably like during the Precambrian. Now, the Precambrian encapsulates the first 4 billion years or so of Earth's history. And this is the time period in which life first appeared on the planet Earth and evolved significantly from simple single cell prokaryotic organisms into complex multicellular organisms, ending in the period ends around 540 years ago at the beginning of the Cambrian period. Now, we know that life on Earth must have existed as early as 3.8 to 3.7 billion years ago. And we know this because we have fossil evidence. There are fossils that were recently discovered off the coast of Greenland that have been radiometrically dated back to about 3.7 to 3.8 billion years ago and represent the simplest forms of life during Earth's early history. We also have some more confirmed fossils from the Shelley Pool Formation in Australia that date back to around 3.3 to 3.4 billion years ago. What these fossils tell us is what the earliest forms of life on the planet likely looked like, and they were likely in the form of stromatolites. So stromatolites are essentially microbial mats. You could almost think of them as a prokaryotic version of sort of moss beds or uh, like what we would call in modern times a biofilm that existed at the bottom of the ocean. Now we do have modern day stromatolites where you can actually see what these look like in modern times, but we also know that this was predominantly the form that life took during the first several billion years of life on the planet Earth. Now what's interesting is Earth was significantly different back then. In fact, life would later on transform Earth to have an atmosphere much more similar to what we have today. The earliest forms of life did get their energy likely from the sun through a form of photosynthesis. Alternatively, some species may have gotten it from geothermal energy coming from deep sea vents or other activity at the bottom of the ocean. But what's interesting about those photosynthetic species is it's most likely these, this, these early forms of photosynthesis did not produce oxygen. They were anoxygenic photosynthesizers. Now this is interesting because most photosynthetic species on the planet Earth today do, derive, do produce oxygen as a byproduct of their metabolism. But that process hadn't evolved yet. In fact, we don't have evidence that oxygenic photosynthesis evolved until, is, er, until somewhere around 2.8 to 3.2 billion years ago. So a long time after life first appeared on the planet Earth. The evidence for, this, uh, for these oxygen producing uh, species, which were most likely similar to modern day cyanobacteria, is an event known as the Great Oxygen Catastrophe, also known as the Oxygen Holocaust. And what ended up happening was the evolution of oxygen producing photosynthesis or oxygen generating photosynthesis led to a change in the Earth's atmosphere. Prior to the appearance of cyanobacteria or oxygen producing uh, oxygen photosynthesizing species, there was very little oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere and the, the atmosphere could actually be considered one that was weakly reducing. In other words, it was an atmosphere that was, uh, was very conducive to the building of large molecules and likely was responsible in some part for life forming in the first place. However, once these species began generating oxygen, they greatly increased the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere, making it, in, making it a more oxidizing environment. And as a result, many of the species that existed on the planet at the time ended up going extinct. And the main reason why was the increased amount of oxygen in the atmosphere actually was highly damaging to those species that had no ability to resist the damage from that oxygen molecules can actually have on tissues. Now, most modern day species have adapted to life in, in, uh, in an oxidating environment uh, that we have had on Earth for the past 2.2 billion years or so since these species began rapidly oxygenating the atmosphere. 
So what were the consequences of this great oxygen catastrophe? Well, it turns out for species like us, it was good. And the main reason why is the extinction of many other species that occupied ecological niches and the oxygenation of the atmosphere actually allowed for the rapid diversification and expansion of a group of species known as the eukaryotes. So eukaryotes were the result of what is known as the endosymbiotic event or an endosymbiotic event. Endosymbiosis occurred when a, when a non-respiring prokaryote consumed a, a prokaryotic cell that could undergo the process of respiration. Now, I do have a video on respiration, but respiration is a highly efficient way in which most eukaryotes and multicellular organisms actually produce their energy. We as humans are respirers. We use our mitochondria to perform many of the metabolic processes that we need. And that's the key event. The endosymbiotic event in which a respiring bacteria was consumed but not digested by its new host cell led to the appearance of the first proto-eukaryote. And over time, the relationship between those respiring uh, endosymbiotes and the, uh, the host cell, the proto-eukaryote, actually became such an intimate one that eventually that mitochondria uh, or that, that respiring bacterium became a part of the cell and gave rise to the domain eukarya, of which all multicellular species, including us, are the descendants. So when did this endosymbiotic event happen in life's history? Well, we know it must have happened sometime prior to about 1.8 billion years ago. And the reason why we know this is because we have the first evidence of, of suspected eukaryotes in the fossil record around 1.8 billion years ago. So the advantage of being a eukaryotic cell was uh, were, were many fold. Once the, at the atmosphere became highly oxygenated by, by photosynthetic uh, prokaryotes, namely cyanobacteria, it became very advantageous because respiring species, eukaryotes, were able to produce significantly more energy than non-respiring species on the planet, and the oxygen was the key molecule that made that possible. Over time, these eukaryotic, these eukaryotic cells would pave the way for large multicellular organisms such as ourselves, and this is largely due to the fact that with these, with these mitochondria, these cells were much more efficient. Now, this also led to the fact that eukaryotic cells could be significantly larger. It also paved the way for the appearance of other organelles, things like membrane-bound nuclei, endoplasmic reticulums, uh, Golgi apparatuses, uh, and all the little organelles that the eukaryotic cells have. And this is going to be hugely important because it's these organelles that are going to allow cells to specialize and differentiate, which would be a ne which is a necessary characteristic of multicellular life. Before we talk about multicellular life, first let's talk about what these early single-celled eukaryotic species might have looked like. Well, we believe that they looked very similar in many ways to modern-day protists. So protists, or the kingdom Protista, is a very interesting group of mostly single-celled eukaryotes. And they're an incredibly diverse group, and if we're talking about cladistics terminology, they are what's called a py polyphyletic group. They're from several different ancestral origins. But collectively, we group them together into a single kingdom as single-celled single -celled eukaryotic species. Now, what's interesting about them is there's not a ton of unifying characteristics about them. They have an incredibly diverse way of ways of performing metabolism, of movement, of ingesting food, ways that they acquire their food. Um, they, they're really hard to sort of classify. Uh, I, I like to refer to them as sort of the uh, taxonomic junk drawer. So we all have this junk drawer in our house that we take out about once a year ago. This is a complete mess. Rearrange it in some way that makes sense. And then a year later, we're looking at it. This drawer is a mess again. You take it out and rearrange it a different way. We've kind of been doing with that with the protists for a while. Uh, so there are lots of different classification schemes out there and they change kind of frequently. So we'll talk in this particular video about one that's been around for a little while. Um, and this is where we've broken down uh, the kingdom protista into um, six super phyla, if you will. So I'll talk about those phyla right now. Uh, the, first the first group of protists are known as uh, the excavata or the excavates. Um, they are united by the fact um, that they have that they are typically asymmetrical and they have a feeding groove um, that that is used uh, that is used to um, help with their food. These are going to include um, mixotrophs like euglena, but it also includes a number of parasites uh, like your trypanosomes and uh, Giardia lamblia all fall into this group uh, as well. 
The next two groups we'll talk about together, these are the amoebozoa and the rhizaria. These are two different groups of amoebas, uh, but they're two different types of amoebas. So uh, the amoebozoans include those amoebas that have an amorphous shape um, and they have lobe lobe style pseudopods. So these are the, when you think of an amoeba, these are sort of the classic uh, type of amoeba. You can see an example here. I'm moving with these sort of wide lobe like pseudopods, these cytoplasmic extensions. The other group, the rhizaria are ones that are going to actually have sort of a hard skeleton, uh, either made out of silicate or uh, calcium carbonate. These are called tests. Um, and they're going to move using these thread-like or needle-like pseudopods. And they're largely broken down into two groups, the uh, foraminifera and the radiolarians. You can see some examples here. Uh, these are actually very, very important index fossils uh, because these tests are very easy to fossilize and they uh, can be found um, throughout many different geologic periods and actually serve as very important index fossils to help sort of date which geologic period we're talking about when we talk about um, that, that relative dating that we like to do when we're ordering rock strata. Uh, so they're super helpful in that context. We'll talk about the next two groups together as well. And these are going to be the Archiplacida and the Chromalveolata. So uh, the Archiplacids are hugely important. The Archiplacids are actually the um, ancestral group to which all modern plants have descended from. Uh, it's in this group where we have the second endosymbiotic event. So in the Archiplastids, uh, in this particular lineage, what happened at some point was one of these uh, early eukaryotes that possessed mitochondria uh, actually did a, had a second endosymbiotic event in which they uh, captured and retained a, uh, a, a, a photosynthetic bacterium. Um, we, we know through molecular studies that it, it clearly is a cyanobacteria that gave rise to the modern day chloroplasts. And uh, there are two different groups uh, within the archaeplastids. There are the green algae, which are the true descendant or the true ancestors of all modern land plants. And then you have the red algae, which are close cousins. Um, they do not, you know, their, their, their modern descendants are still red algae. They did not give rise to uh, any other modern land plant species. Those come strictly from the green algae, uh, the green algae groups of the archaeplastids. The other group, the chromalveolata, are your brown and your golden algae. So when you look at like kelp, for example, uh, they belong to this group. Um, these are likely, uh, these are mostly colonial uh, in the way they exist, as are many of the archaeplastids. Um, what's interesting about uh, the chromalveolata is they've actually acquired their chloroplasts through secondary endosymbiosis. So you can actually think of the chromalveolates as kind of ancestors of uh, red algae, and here's why. It appears that um, a, a eukaryote that possessed mitochondria consumed a red alga at some point, and that's actually what gave rise to the chloroplasts that we see in brown and golden algae. So that's called secondary endosymbiosis. And the reason why is they endosymbiosed something that had already endosymbiosed something else, and that's how they became photosynthetic uh, in nature, by acquiring a red alga uh, as an endosymbiotic host and using that red alga's ability to make energy from the sun through photosynthesis. So with the archaeplastids, we have the descendants of all modern land plants. But what about uh, animals and fungi? Well, these are actually going to have descended from this final group of, of protists that we know as the opisthoconta. So the opisthocons actually uh, consist mainly of two modern species these days. Uh, you have the coenoflagellates, which uh, have a very interesting structure. Uh, they, they have a, a collar made out of these, uh, these, these cilia that allow the, a contractile collar made out of the cilia and, and a single flagellum that allow them to sort of ingest food that way through this mechanism. Uh, and they're actually known to uh, form these colonies uh, like you can see in this particular graphic here. What's particularly interesting though is when we look at the simplest of all animals, the sponges, we actually see cells inside of sponges that look very, very similar to coenoflagellates. In fact, they're known as coenocytes. And it turns out that the molecular, the genetic, and the, and, and, the, and the molecular data that we have actually says that the similarities between coenocytes and, and coenoflagellates is not the result of convergent evolution. It's actually the result of direct ancestry. And it's quite likely that sponges actually evolved from a group, a group of col a colonial coenoflagellates that actually just became so interdependent on each other that gave rise to modern day multicellular life. So what does it mean to actually be multicellular? What's the difference then? Um, we know lots of different protists, for example, even lots of different bacterial species live in colonial arrangements, things like streptococcus and staphylococcus, or things like coenoflagellates or algae. 
um, in the form of kelp and uh, Volvox, for example, is another great example. So what's the difference between a colonial lifestyle and true multicellularity? And the answer actually comes down to uh, something fairly simple. When you look at organisms that are colonial unicellular organisms, those cells are not differentiated. And what I mean by that is while they have increased communication, while they can sometimes work together to do things, the cells within a colonial uh, unicellular colony are not specialized in any way, shape, or form. They could all live independently of that colony if they wanted to. Are they better off living in the colony? Probably, and that's why they're so successful that way. But if they were to live alone, they would be perfectly fine. They could make their own nutrition, live their own lifestyle, reproduce, and so on and so forth. That's not true of multicellular organisms. When you have a multicellular organism, what you're looking at is an organism made up of many different cell types, all of which are interdependent upon each other. And that actually extends not just beyond the, the, the cell itself, but within the cell. And this is the key, and this is the main reason why eukaryotic cells are the only ones that can give rise to multicellular life. They're the only cells that possess the capability of specializing. And the reason why is because eukaryotic cells have organelles. So for example, when you look at a, when you look at a skeletal muscle cell, one of the things you'll notice is that it's packed full of mitochondria. Why? Because this is a cell type that is uh, responsible for doing things like contracting to be able to allow the movement of that particular organism. If you look at liver cells, for example, the liver is an organ tasked with detoxifying harmful substances from the body. Well, what organelle aids in that process? The smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And when you look at hepatocytes, liver cells, you see that they're chock full of smoothie R. Now, they're not chock full of mitochondria like the muscle cells are, and the, and the muscle cells are not chock full of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Why? Because those cells have specialized to do certain things. Or when you look at macrophages, which are cells that belong to the immune system, their job is to go around and eat cellular debris, cellular waste, or invading pathogens. Well, if you're going to go around eating things, you better have lots of cellular stomachs, the lysosome. And what do we find inside of macrophages? We find them packed full of lysosomes to allow them to specialize in that task. And this is the key reason why prokaryotes could never give rise to multicellular life, because they can't specialize. They don't have organelles. They're too small, they're too simple, and they don't have the, the capacity as a cell type to actually specialize in any way, shape, or form. And that's what we see when we get to sponges. We start to see that they have specialized cell types with dedicated jobs. Now, the epistochons were not did not just did not just give rise to uh, did not just give rise to all modern animal species. They also gave rise a separate group of epistochons gave rise to all modern fungi, which also explains the high degree of similarity we see at the cellular level between fungal cells and animal cells. Now, we wouldn't see the, uh, the appearance of complex multicellular life in the fossil record until the end of the Precambrian. And this fossil evidence comes in the form of the Ediacaran biota. I've spoke about the Ediacaran biota in a previous video, but the Ediacaran biota is interesting, and we don't refer to them as classic animals. And the main reason why is we're not sure if they would truly be considered, metas truly considered animals in, in, the con in, in modern day context. They are often asymmetrical. They often have uh, unique body plans. And for the most part, the Ediacaran biota all disappear from the fossil record about 541 million years ago when we get to the beginning of the, of the Cambrian period and the end of the Precambrian. In my next video, we'll talk about all the different kinds of animals that we find in the Cambrian fossil record and talk about why the, why, talk about, um, uh, and moving forward, we'll talk about how these species changed over time throughout evolutionary history. Thank you so much for tuning in today. This is the first in a series of videos I'll be doing where we track the evolutionary history of species throughout the geologic time record. Um, today we talked about the Precambrian, we talked about what early life looked like, and we talked about how by the end of the Precambrian life it evolved from simple photosynthetic prokaryotes up to now complex multicellular life. In my next video, we'll talk about what life looked like in the Cambrian starting about 541 million years ago. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you learned a lot and I'll talk to you soon.